Good afternoon. Good afternoon, and uh, welcome to the School of Earth Sciences uh, seminar series. We typically have these at 1.45 on Fridays. Um, I don't remember why we picked 1.45 as opposed to 1.30 or 2, but I'm sure it was important. Um, uh, yesterday, I had the pleasure of doing the introduction, and today I'm going to uh, turn it over to Professor Joachim, uh, Joachim Morcott, who actually is the uh, chairperson for the Bonnaker Selection Committee. And I, I want to give him a round of applause for doing such a wonderful job uh, with this year's event. So it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Linda or Lindy Elkin-Stanton as the 78th um, Baunocker lecturer. Um, you heard, so this is a lecture series um, that's been going on for um, about 80 years, I guess, named after John Adams Baunocker, who was the um, state, Ohio State, sorry, chair of Ohio State Department of Geology uh, and created the first um, full geological map of our state that apparently uh, was the reference until only a couple of years ago. Uh, we're also lucky that um, in his testament, he basically left a big endowment for this lecture series. Um, so we've had um, a long list of eminent speakers um, going way back to 1937. Um, here's just a couple of them that we picked out. I'm stealing these slides from uh, Stephen Lauer yesterday. Um, so one of the earliest speakers, uh, Uri, was the discoverer of deuterium, Nobel Prize laureate. Um, we had a speaker in my birth year, Maruski, was involved in the Apollo, Viking, and Voyager miss missions. Um, as I hope many of you know, Voyager has been flying through the solar system ever since, and has uh, actually left the solar system in a couple of years ago and is now in interstellar space. Uh, so that's how long this lecture series has been going on. Ursula Marvin was the first um, woman to do um, groundbreaking research in Antarctica in 1980. Uh, and then we have climate activists that you all know, like former uh, Senator, presidential candidate Al Gore and James Hansen, and even more famous, our own Lonnie Thompson, who I think we have in the audience again, uh, who gave this lecture in 2002. Um, as well as many other um, well-known and very successful academics um, and astronauts. Certainly, uh, Lindy Elkin Stanton fits well in that uh, series. Uh, she obtained her bachelor, master's, um, and PhD all at MIT, a full trifecta of the earth science disciplines um, in geology, geochemistry, and then PhD in geophysics. Um, and no, if you look at these years, she did not take 15 years to complete her PhD. Um, <laughs> but actually took, um, I think, eight years off to work in industry before returning to uh, MIT for a doctorate degree. Uh, after that, she was a researcher at Brown University, uh, returned to MIT uh, for a faculty position uh, for five years, I believe, and then became the director of the Department of Terrestrial Magnetism at uh, Carnegie Inst Institute of Science um, before um, moving to her current position in 2014 as the um, Foundation and Regents Professor at the School of Earth and Space Exploration at Arizona State University. So not surprisingly, there's a long list of scientific accolades, lots of um, peer-reviewed publications in top journals, um, lots of academic uh, awards. I'm just listing some of them here, uh, culminating last year in uh, being inducted in the uh, Science Hall of Fame or also known as the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, in addition to all these academic achievements, uh, she's also a pretty prolific writer and wrote a, a beautiful um, six book um, series on the solar system, right? So kind of astronomy or science books, uh, as well as a memoir um, that's also receiving very good reviews from both critics and the general audience. And it was kind of fun to see yesterday that several people in the audience had already uh, read this book even before 
uh, we invited uh, her to come over and give this lecture. Um, she even has an asteroid named after her. Um, maybe that's the question somebody can ask what the story is behind that. We didn't get around to that question yet. Um, and uh, besides her current research, which involves the NASA space mission to Psyche, which she gave an excellent talk about yesterday, uh, she also still has a um, other project on the side, um, like a startup company related to more efficient um, education. And on our website, you can find a great TED talk um, talking about those ideas. So our research involves planet formation, which I don't know if it started, but at least at some point involved field research in Siberia. Um, and then through a quite a circuitous pathway uh, has led her uh, to fly through the whole solar system. And ultimately, um, next year, will fly to the Psyche asteroid, which is thought to be basically a naked uh, core of a, of a planet. Um, so that was an excellent lecture yesterday. So you can think of today's lecture as the prequel to that one, um, which goes back to our research and field work in Siberia. And with that, let me give you the floor. You can hear me okay? Excellent. Oh, and there is a cookie, fabulous. Well, thanks very much for coming, everybody. It was super fun to talk about this stuff, and it's just been a great visit here and really lovely honor, um, like a nice lift in a tough year with the mission slipping its launch and all kinds of uh, drama around that. It was just really lovely to be invited here to do this and, and get this medal and meet you all. And, uh, and truly, uh, you all have done an amazing job of, of making me feel welcome and setting up an incredible schedule. And it was super fun to talk about Psyche yesterday, but this is even more fun in some ways because uh, we already know so many answers. Psyche's all ahead of time. So uh, these are columnar basalts in Siberia. And that is Seth Burgess. Does anybody know Seth Burgess? He's a geochronologist. You should know him if you don't know him. Great guy. And he figured out how to do some great dating, which I'll just sort of mention at the end of these rocks. I started being uh, really interested in flood basalts. Uh, and, and so I, I'm just gonna keep polling the audience because I'm not sure who's here. I think we have some fabulous like astronomy people and earth science people. Is there anybody here who would like me to discuss what a flood basalt is in a little bit more detail? Or is everybody kind of cool with it? Yes, I love it when people are willing to raise their hands. Thank you. Because nobody knows everything, right? Uh, so we think of volcanism on the Earth um, as mainly kind of small volume stuff that happens along plate boundaries. So you have little volcanoes at the mid-ocean ridges, and you have explosive volcanoes at subduction zones like Pinatubo and Mount St. Helens. And um, oops, is something wrong? No, it's all good. And, uh, and, but every once in a while, maybe a dozen times in Earth history, a whole different kind of volcanism happens where suddenly some fissures open, uh, sometimes under the ocean, sometimes up on land, and, and uh, what we call basaltic magma. So, so not gas rich, uh, effusive, calm streams of magma, like it mostly happens in Hawaii, start flowing out. And they flow out and they flood and they don't stop. And then they cover a huge amount of land with magma. And they're kind of mysterious. And so at the time that I started thinking about this, which was during grad school, uh, uh, after my 10 years off doing other things, which is very interesting, I came back super interested in, in these flood basalts because there wasn't a lot of agreement about what caused them. People thought they, and still think that they are um, fluid dynamical plumes of hot but solid mantle material coming up through the mantle, impinging on the bottom of the continental plates for continental ones and melting through pressure release and then flooding out. But a question that we had was, why do they suddenly all mainly stop after a million years? Why don't they just kind of peter on forever? A lot of them really just really erupt for about a million years and then they stop. And so I was very interested in that from a geodynamical point of view and I was running these Fortran codes on fluid dynamics of mantle convection trying to answer that, which is not even part of the story. The other thing that flood basalts have uh, associated with them are giant extinction events. And, uh, and, and the very biggest extinction event of, of all in earth history is the, is the end Permian. And so during the end Permian uh, extinction, which was 252, oh, we are not working here, 252 million years ago. I think again, I just need to click into this. There we go. Uh, trilobites, anybody here a fan of trilobites? Yes, 
Okay, so I, I grew up in Ithaca, New York, not too far from here, finding trilobite fossils in the Devonian and Ordovician. Sadly, the end Permian was the extinction that killed them all. End of the trilobites, very, very sad. Uh, end of the crinoids, also crinoid fans here, I hope. Yes, excellent. Did you know they could be up to 40 meters long? And they were all wiped out at the end Permian. Um, they were kind of like, uh, like those sea worms of, of today. Eurypterids, kind of like giant lobsters, two and a half meters wiped out. In fact, the end Permian killed above 95% of the species in the ocean and above 70% of the species on land. It was almost the end of multicellular life on Earth. And uh, so when I started studying this, um, there are lots of people have worked on both the end Permian and the Siberian flood basalts. And I'm sure that people in this room have worked on these problems. They're big problems and very compelling and interesting to work on. Um, but I was quite mystified about how we could have the biggest ever continental flood basalt, the Siberian flood basalts, the biggest ever Earth extinction, the end Permian, seemingly, but not absolutely proven to happen at the same time, but with no agreed upon causal mechanism. And so I thought, here's a problem that's really worth trying to figure out. And so uh, wrote, I wrote, I, when I was, was a postdoc, I started organizing this team of people. And um, maybe some of you know Leonard Johnson at NSF and his program, Continental Dynamics. It's really a great visionary guy. And, um, and he helped us out um, with a little bit of seed funding. And then he ended up funding this in the end. So we had um, uh, 30 scientists from eight different countries trying to look at this from all different angles. And, and, uh, and one of my big challenges, which remains in every group project I've ever worked on, is how do you prevent the individual members from taking their little slice of the pie and running back to their lab and doing what they were going to do before you ever talk to them anyway? Um, how do you get them to really synergize together? And this is a big thing in the, in the bird center, obviously, you need to get many disciplines working together. So I was, I don't know, 70 or 80 percent successful on this project. But that's kind of the background of it. We're trying to solve this multidisciplinary problem. And so what about the volcanism? So uh, these are just representative scaled boxes of the volume of some famous volcanic events. So here's Mount St. Helens down at the bottom. And I know as time goes on, there are fewer and fewer people in the room who really remember that consciously from their own lives. But I know there's some of us here. <laughs> I know, it was such a big deal, you guys, seriously. So, uh, but Dini, Wini, right? So Iceland in 1783, the Lockheed eruption. Anybody know about Lockheed? I know some of you do. So Lockheed, uh, a fissure eruption, so a similar kind of eruption, but not a flood basalt, um, released, fascinatingly, a tremendous amount of fluorine. Fluorine, super, super toxic. Have you heard of the fluorine martyrs? The chemists who originally discovered or identified the atom fluorine, managed to break it apart from other things that it liked to stay bonded to, all died because it's that poisonous and terrible. So one of the things fluorine did with Lockheed is it killed all the vegetation, which killed all the sheep, which caused a giant famine and tens of thousands of people died. And so that's really interesting. Why would there be fluorine? If, you're, if you are an igneous petrologist, you're thinking to myself, yourself, Iceland, that's just basaltic magma, a simple partial melt of the upper mantle. What is fluorine doing in there? So this is foreshadowing. You recognize it as a literary you know, tactic. <laughs> all right. So there's Iceland, there's Mount Pinatubo, another famous Krakatoa, super famous. See how tiny those are? Then there's the, um, the Yellowstone eruption. So that's, you know, someday in the future, we have that to look forward to again. The San Juan Mountains that made the, the Fish Canyon tough. There's a huge layer of, of um, ash fall rock that's all over the Western US. And here's Siberia compared to those. All right, so, so, um, so a lot of persons, people's first reaction would be, well, duh, of course everything died, right? But, um, but not so simple because flood basalts are, are almost exclusively thought to be, as I use this word, effusive, just calm running. Like most of Hawaii, you can walk up to them and look at them. And if you don't fall in, you haven't died and you go home and you're okay. Not like Pinatubo, like, right? I mean, truly, not like Pinatubo where you really have to flee for your life. These are, these are kind of rivers of lava, um, even though there's a lot of rivers and you expect them to kind of kill everything they touched. But what about the rest of the world? Because these extinctions happen everywhere in the oceans and everywhere in the land. So they affected the whole world. Um, and so here's where they are uh, in the modern day um, in Siberia. And, and you can see, um, see the little uh, crescent of Lake Baikal down there, just above Mongolia. And then up at the top under the blue, there's a little peninsula. That's the Timur Peninsula where a lot of frozen mammoths come from. And so in red is where 
uh, the, the flood basalts uh, and their associated rocks are bedrock and that if you were to burrow like um, some sort of tundra burrowing animal, I don't know if there is one, down through the, through the um, permafrost and all the moss, you would come to the flood basalts. And then where in the blue is where they're covered by younger rocks, but you can get them by drill cores. And, and the Soviet Union had one of the most extensive, maybe the most extensive geological field program in the history of the world. And, uh, and uh, around April 1st of, of every year, they would send out um, uh, uh, trains of caribou with caches of food for the field geologists that would be later marching out through Siberia to map Siberia. And it was called um, uh, Geologist Day, um, which I kind of love. And they had about a million people working on the geology of Siberia at that time. And they made incredible maps, incredible maps. That's really helped us quite a lot. And they drill, they would go out in the middle of the, of the taiga and they cut down trees and build buildings and then they would uh, scrape off the sphagnum moss and they would drill and they'd fill these core sheds with, with, with drill cores. And so if you go to the right Russian National Academy building, you can find the paper records of the drill cores and then you can hire a helicopter and fly into the taiga to these abandoned, fallen down, drilling structures, and, and if the snow hasn't collapsed the roof or the wildfire hasn't burned it over, you can actually find the core, the core um, drawers with the right Cyrillic, and you can get the cores. And so we did some of that too, which was pretty amazing, because we had a lot of great Russian colleagues, and, and we did this all together. So during the time that these actually erupted, back 252 million years ago, was the time of Pangaea. So there was a single landmass. Um, but the flood basalts were uh, about the same latitude as they are here. And so we set out to say, are there ways that this eruption could have caused global climate change such that it would drive the extinction? Because there really has to be global climate change to cause extinctions around the entire planet the way it happened then. They were not localized. And, and I will just um, you know, cut to the chase and say it was not a meteoroid impact. Um, of course, everyone wanted it to be that after Chicxulub, and so people have looked exhaustively through the rock record all over the world, and occasionally they'll find a little chip of uh, meteorite, but of course you would expect that because meteorites fall all the time, but there's, there's really no evidence for a big global catastrophe like that. And so what is left? Something that causes atmospheric chemical change. So that's what we are looking for. Um, so expeditions. I'm just going to show you a bunch of field photos because who can resist? Because that was just, these were crazy, crazy expeditions. When did I go? I went in 2006, 2008. My team went out without me in 2009, 2010, 2012, I guess. And then uh, 2013, we did a follow up in Iceland, not in Siberia. I think that was our, those were our years. Um, so, first, I just want to say a little bit about the team. This is a little bit of our team. Um, and uh, in front of one of these kind of dire, um, uh, me eight uh, helicopters and we, that we would occasionally rent to fly in. How many of you have traveled around in Siberia? Yeah, taken helicopters? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes they have bullet holes in them. The first one that we got into, the, uh, the power supply was connected to the rotors with what looked like a giant alligator clamp in the middle of the, uh, I mean, there's so many stories. I would not tell my story. Um, twice we carried the Explorers Club flag. Um, I want to especially point out um, Sam Bowering on the right, who was a fantastic geochronologist who passed away a few years ago and was a tremendous support and mentor to me. And in fact, he's the person who said to me one day toward the end of my PhD, you know, Linda, you've been thinking a lot about the end Permian and the Siberian flood basalts. Why don't you put together a team and really try to solve it? And at that point in my career, I hadn't thought of myself as senior enough to do a thing like that. So it was his like poking that kind of made me start. And um, and then right behind me there is Ben Black, um, who was, that was his first year of graduate school at MIT. In fact, I, I wasn't even going to bring him this year because I hadn't properly met him yet. I just hired him on to be a grad student. We were going to a very remote place where there would be no help if we were in trouble. And I didn't want, you know, you worry. You don't want somebody who's a whiner because they can really ruin everything. <laughs> and you don't want somebody who's going to go curl up in their sleeping bag and not help cook dinner. And so, uh, and so he told me, look, I'm an Eagle Scout. I promise I'll be great. And so... And so I said to him, I said to him, Ben, you have to, you know, raise your hand and you have to swear to me that no matter how ugly it gets, you will not whine. And he stood in my office and said, I swear I will not whine. 
Of course, he turned out to be the least whiny person on earth, and he's just an amazing person. He's now on um, faculty at Rutgers, so I, I recommend him to everybody. So that's just a little part of our team. Um, I'm a little, uh, I'm worried about our Russian colleagues who did so much for us, and even in that period of time, they were interviewed by the FSB and were at risk because of doing so much collaboration with the West, and we had lots of funding to bring them to conferences in the US and back and forth, and so I just wish them all the best. Uh, so this is a tiny diversion to a topic that I feel very strongly about, um, which is the way that a lot of modern academia is, is set up in a hero model, where one senior professor owns the pyramid or the hill of resources and people. It could be other faculty or researchers, graduate students, undergraduate students, postdocs, all beholden to that single person and his or her ideas. Now, this is not inherently a bad model, and I'm not attacking anybody. There's many ways that that's been fabulous and continues to be fabulous, and it's been great for a thousand years, and it's gotten us to where we are, but it has certain inherent flaws that I think it's important to consider. And, uh, and so one of them is that we tend to make scientific progress by carving out little bits of real estate around our mountains until our mountains run into our neighbor's mountain, and then we stop because we're going to fight. And you know everybody kind of owns their topic at their university. And uh, I think that we have so many imperatives in the world today that it's incumbent upon us to also develop, also develop another model where instead of focusing the science on the charisma and fame of an individual, instead you focus as a team on an external question that requires everyone's expertise and that will take a larger non-incremental step toward the kind of knowledge that we want. And so we've been working on ways to put together those kinds of teams. And this Siberia project was really my first experiment in that direction. And just to remember, even Jonas Salk, famous, right? So fame was a big thing for him. The object is not to put down the other, but to raise up the other. And that's often not how academia works. Um, but it's actually possible to do high quality, rigorous work while having civil discourse. Um, sometimes when I was in particularly fractious departments, I would ask people to imagine that their mother or grandmother was standing behind their chair and then see if they wanted to rephrase the question they just asked. <laughs> so anyway, I think it's worth just having a little discussion about those topics once in a while, the topics of culture and team building and the purpose of what we're doing and how we can be even more helpful to the world. End of advertisement. All right, back to expeditions. All right, so, uh, so here's a, a close-up map of the stripes are the part that was what red in the original slide where, where those are bedrock. And the solid pale color is, is, um, is where it's surrounded, covered by other rocks, but available by um, for the drill core. And you can see here that here's Lake Baikal down here, and there's the Chimera Peninsula up there. And then um, that curvy island there is Novaya Zemula, where, where the world's largest nuclear explosion was done, and parts of that are still closed. Um, and in green are all the places we went on our field trips. And so these were just crazy, fabulous expeditions that I enjoyed so much. Uh, the kind of thing we would be flown out of a town on a helicopter and dropped up on a river with some a dire inflatable boats, I'll show you in a moment. And then we would drift down the river, stopping at outcrops and collecting rocks and then try to get a helicopter back out. But you know, there's only two helicopters in that town and one is broken and then they're fogged in. And so had something happened and our sat phones still worked, you know, it's quite possible that we could not be rescued actually. We're 250 kilometers away from in an area with no railroads and no roads whatsoever um, for thousands of kilometers. And I just super enjoyed that, <laughs> super enjoyed it. Uh, and you can see we went lots of places. We really tried to cover the territory, but because Siberia is, uh, at least it was to my eye, and I don't know the rest of you who've been there, what you think, unimaginably gigantic wilderness as far as you can see, like bigger than I imagined the earth was of sphagnum bogs and fir trees. Um, the only real places to find outcrops are in river cuts. That's basically it. There are very few rocks that you find outside of river cuts, unless you go to these core sheds, which are exciting too. And so I, I took uh, advanced uh, Russian language while I was postdoc at, at Brown University with all of these uh, Slavic language majors who already spoke the language and would just look at me and roll their eyes while I tried to learn how to say and <laughs> So that I could have little conversations with people and read the signs and stuff. So it was a, just a big adventure from all sides. So here the helicopters dropped us and we've unloaded our stuff and we're lying on it so that the rotor wash doesn't blow it away while the helicopter takes off. We're very lucky with our helicopter and our boat captains. 
nobody was drunk and uh, because that is seriously a very, very big risk in Russia. Um, and in fact, uh, um, Sam Bowering had had an adventure where they got in one of these giant mining trucks, you know, the kind with the wheels that are taller than you and they can just go across country wherever they want. And he had to go with the stream of people across a series of river crossings. And every time they came up to the river crossing, the driver would get out and look at the river and see where the road went. And then they would take a shot of vodka for good luck and then they would drive across the river. And so like by the fifth river crossing, they missed the road and the, and the boat started and the, the truck started floating away and sinking. And they had to pop out the emergency hatch, which thank God did pop out. And then they had to swim through the icy, icy Arctic river to get to the side of the river and try to start a fire and find a person. And so, I mean, you can easily die, sadly, but nobody did, everybody's good. So that's why it's still funny to talk about because it was all right. <laughs> all right, so this is also like a little advertisement of something that I, that just, I loved more than anything. So you fly up to the, uh, the Arctic inlet at the base of the Tymere Peninsula to this little town named Hottengef. And um, we flew out of um, Dnukova Airport in, in, in Moscow. And, and those, those flights only start after the snow's gone. And that's the only way to get to Hottengef. So the people who want to go back in the summer and see their families, they're all lined up to buy their tickets. And we got on the plane. I never understood this. So we wait in the waiting room, the, you know, the whatever you call it, the gate and go out to the flight with everyone you're waiting with. And the flight is mysteriously already full of people. Like, where did they come from? I never understood. Tickets have no seat numbers. The seats are filled with baggage. So people are, and the, and the, uh, the stewards were up at the front of the plane talking on their cell phones while we were taxiing and we weren't even sitting down yet. And so people started nicely throwing their baggage out of the seats so we could sit down. And we sat down and the plane lumbered along and managed to get off the ground. And then uh, we thought we'd go find out where our colleagues ended up. So we undid our seatbelts and we stood up and our seats fell over backwards because they were not bolted to the plane. <laughs> and so I, I, just, I loved these things. I loved them. They were so fun. So in Hatenga, we're up there staying. There's a little geologist guest house, which was also a whole anecdote to itself. And um, we had to wait a few days because some selfish, selfish mammoth hunters had gotten there first and taken the helicopter. And so we had to wait for the helicopter to come back from their drop-off before we could have our drop-off. So our nice friends were trying to give us tours of interesting things. So they took us down um, this long, creaky wooden staircase to the river, at the bottom of the river cliff. And then we walked along the river cliff and there's a big door just set in the side of the river cliff. And it turns out they'd taken a, a, a tunnel driller and drilled into the side of the river cliff under the frost line. So it's in permafrost and they made a museum for frozen mammoths. So it's basically the holding place for the frozen mammoths that get brought in out of the Tymere Peninsula. And those bricks on the floor are water ice bricks. They're just permanently frozen. And they, put, they polish them with a floor polisher. Those are all um, 25,000 year old mammoth tusks. Um, this, for some reason, they had a frozen wolverine in there. I don't know why. Um, and, but they also had uh, two whole mammoths. And I don't know if any of you have seen, there was a NOVA program a number of years ago where they showed they found a whole mammoth and they cut it out like a block of the permafrost and they lifted it with a helicopter and its tusks were coming out the front. Did anybody see that show? It's been a little while, maybe you haven't. It's in there, it was in there when we went. And you could step up on a step stool and pat the fur on its back, the 25,000 year old mammoth fur. So this was just another thrill and it did help pass the time while we were fretting, waiting for our helicopter. So the helicopter drops us and there's um, Ben Black and Scotty Simper is an is a, is a adventure and wilderness cameraman. He's climbed Mount Everest twice, holding an IMAX camera, walking backwards in front of the people who were actually climbing Everest. <laughs> he's gone after, uh, he's gone after uh, man-eating tigers in India. He's kayaked between icebergs north of Baffin Island. Like he's an amazing guy and he came out to film us twice. And here he's helping Ben find scrap wood and lash together one of our dire inflatable boats. That was what was, and so we'd offered to bring a, what do you call a nice inflatable boat? Like a, what's the word for it? Zodiac. And, and our Russian colleagues told us we should not do that because it would be so much higher quality than all the equipment that was in the whole town that it would make us too much of a showpiece and a target and make the people feel bad. And so we did bring some, um, we did bring some foldable canoes. These are fantastic folding canoes. They fold up their 30 kilograms and you can check them as baggage and then they come out in a full expedition weight canoe. And these are, um, the first rocks that we visited on, on this river, on the Katoi River. Uh, the Katoi River, as it flows north into the Arctic Ocean, you actually, flow, you actually go upward through the stratigraphy. 
So you start, this is a very important part of the story, you start in the sedimentary basin underneath the flood basalts. So it turns out, this is kind of like the secret answer to the whole mystery. It turns out that, the, that where the Siberian flood basalts erupted is the site of an evaporite basin where there had been a very large inland sea that evaporated and left behind it all the things that happen, right? When all the things that happen when you, when you evaporate the ocean. And so at the bottom is limestone. So these are huge limestone spires. And then there's huge layers of gypsum, which is filled with sulfur. And, and there's lots of carbon through all of this. And then at the very end of the evaporite basin are what are called bittern salts, where the last things, the fluorine, fluorine and carbon uh, and chlorine all come out at the end. And then over that is a big layer of coal. And so a lot of people had said, the coal is it. It had to be the, the magmas and, you know, interacted with the coal. And so that was a big part of the mystery we're trying to solve. So here we are looking at the limestone, taking samples. This is me in one of our most horrible kinds of little inflatable tourist boats. <laughs> we, I can't even believe we put up with this. They're so dangerous. These rivers are really big. They're like a kilometer across, this one is, and, and fast moving and freezing cold. And, uh, and we did our best and we all made it, which was kind of amazing. And so uh, there we are camping by the Kutui River. It's just so beautiful uh, to be out there with nobody. That's my tent. I love that tent. Don't you get to love your tent when you're camping or else you hate it? It's one or the other. Right? You love it forever or you hate it completely. There were mosquitoes. Um, these mosquitoes that we encountered on our various trips were pretty slow moving. And actually their biggest um, downside was that they would fly into your mouth and kind of choke you while you were walking. Um, and so we, we all brought 100% deep. This is the reaction I get. So, so, so all of these trips, they're like, like, it completely splits people. People either like, please take me, I'll do anything, put me in your suitcase, that's amazing. And then other people are like, wait, you didn't have a shower for four weeks? I would never, never, never do that. And so, yeah, bugs, that's another thing. Um, and we used to play that famous field game, snap your, your field notebook shut and see how many mosquitoes you kill. And whoever kills the most wins. <laughs> this is not a bad haul for me. Um, so that's one of those right in the rain notebooks. Um, this is how we cooked in the Russian field fashion, uh, just in pots. And so in the morning, we would make oatmeal or gechka, like a cracked wheat, and we would um, put dried fruit and stuff in. Sweetened condensed milk was a big part of it, and tea. And then there was no lunch. And then 12 hours later, because of course it's 24 hours of daylight, then we would bring the same pot out and scoop up the river and make pasta or gechka and pour in like ketchup and canned meat. And for those of you who've been in Siberia, did you eat those cans of miasa? Yeah. <laughs> they have a cartoon picture of a cow on the front, but you really don't know what's inside. And miasa just means meat. And so, so there were a lot of culinary adventures as well. But again, everyone was fine. And so here's a picture of the condensed, sweetened condensed milk, which goes in the tea and everything that you eat. And so, so there was one other woman on this trip, a, a brand new graduate student, Anya. And she comes by and she looks at me regarding this can. And she says, it's just a mosquito. Like, what is the problem? Like, I don't care about the mosquito. It's the anaerobic mold on the lid that's causing me you know, concern. And she, she, she swipes her finger across it and slurps it off and go, is normal. And so, so then we got over ourselves and, and ate it. it was all, everything was fine. Um, so, so, um, so here was a moment, you can see how happy I'm looking and you can see the steepness and the instability of the melting permafrost shedding off kind of river cliff that we climbed up to get to this place. But this is the interface um, between, uh, between the coal down here and the flood basalts up above. So that was a place where I could put my hand on the very first lava flow of the Siberian flood basalts and it was super exciting. Um, and, and if you look back down, this is the, can you see that's the canoe right there, the little red thing. Um, and so this was really hairy. Like you're, you're walking up these hills and uh, because the permafrost is melting and it's landsliding every night, huge landslides where all that you have to sleep on, on the, um, the inside of the curves because on the outside, all the trees come down every night from permafrost melting. And you're kind of sinking in up to your knee in melted permafrost like foam, hoping that it's not gonna landslide with you. So that was probably foolish. But like a lot of us in geology, like we didn't have hard hats. I don't know, like we're just <sighs> bad, bad people, but we were fine. We got lots of samples and we got to go to a place called the Guli, which I don't know if anyone here would have, would have, uh, would recognize that, the Guli province. It's an area of carbonatite magnetism. 
where the lavas that erupted were liquid, literally liquid limestone, CaCO2. And um, I think we were the first Westerners ever to visit it. It was discovered by gulag prisoners in 1929 who went there on caribou trains in the winter. Um, and, because, and it's been mined a number of times because there's amazing mineralogy there. And so this was a long, long hike to a particular kind of um, rocks called, called, called mimakites or mimachites. And if you've heard of them, then you'll go, wow, because they're so cool for people who study igneous petrology. They're really obscure. And they're very hard to get to. So for those of you who are into it, it was amazing. I was very tired. We, we hiked about nine kilometers over rivers and across and up, and then we finally got there. From the air, the outside of the Guli province is a big circle, like 50 kilometers across, completely without plant life because it's, it's pure olivine. And the magnesium in the olivine is toxic to plants. So you can see it from the air where you're going. And the ground, that's my foot on the left, um, in parts of it is just paved with the, with, the, with the mica phlogopite. Phlogopite is a kind of mica that is stabilized by fluorine. Amazing, isn't it? And so these are the mimakites that if you're into this, that's very exciting, just a little part of them. And you can see it's, it's you know, 10 kilometers to the next outcrop. And so, uh, so it was a great workout. And there's my friend Roma Veselovsky with the Explorers Club flag on top of one of these 252 million year old carbonatites. And here's me and, and another Russian colleague also with our hands on the, on the interface between the coal on the bottom and the, and the basaltic magmas on top. That was like the moment of the eruption. Um, so we looked over and over again for evidence of interaction between, between the basaltic magmas here in the left in tan and the coaly sediments here on the right. We looked for um, baked margins. And there was a big team out of Oslo and a team out of France that were working on baking what happened when you have magma intrude and just bake the sediments. And they did big calculations of what could be given off by that. So that was Sveta Planka um, and uh, Henrik Svensson and uh, Nick Arndt and his group all did a lot of that work. And we found relatively little evidence for that. So that was disappointing. Here's Seth Burgess next to the top of the limestone and all the rest of that is gypsum filled with sulfur. So I think you're seeing where I'm going. The magmas are interacting with all of these things that have the opportunity to turn into toxic volatiles. That's where we're going with this. But here's the thing that I personally was most excited about for the whole project. And that was that there had been reports, um, like a side sentence in a paper, and um, evidence in the maps, uh, the, si the Siberian bedrock maps, that there was a lot of explosive volcanism before the lava started coming out something that's not very common in flood basalts. And so these would be, um, these would be rocks called, called tufts, that are airfall ashes, or phreato magmatism, which is when the magma interacts with um, fluids under the surface or on the surface and explodes into ash and creates rocks that way. And uh, we kept looking for them and looking for them. There are no papers on them in, in, until ours in the English language literature. And, and they were not easy to find on the map because the map is a bedrock map. So you knew that if you could burrow 50 meters through, through rock, you'd find them. But where could we find them on the surface? So this was the first time I saw them. See that outcrop and how it's weathered like chevrons? That is uh, almost always a tough. And so I looked at that and I'm like, whoa, that is explosive. Look how big it is. And we were on our way back in a helicopter on a long trip and we could not stop and there wasn't enough fuel. And I was like, wait, wait, that's what I want more than anything. And it took, it took us uh, um, five years to get back to this place on the Angara River. And what we found on the Angara River, north of Ustilinsk, um, for about uh, 200 or 250 kilometers, a long, long part of the Angara River, every single cliff is from explosive um, volcanism, from the level of the water to the erosive boundary at the top, sometimes 150 meters. And in the drill cores reported by the Soviets, there are places where it's 600 meters thick. So this is probably thicker and a larger province of explosive volcanism than anywhere else on Earth that's ever been found. So now we're beginning to get somewhere. You're trying to make global climate change. You need something that is going to push the gases above the tropopause into the stratosphere so they can go around the entire Earth. Otherwise, if the volcanic eruptions are just local, They'll hurt things that are downwind, but they won't change the climate of the entire Earth. But now we found what might be the biggest explosive volcanic province in the world. And uh, 
you, you, those of you who are into this might be interested to know that all of these have the bulk composition of basalt, meaning that they don't really look like an arc volcanic, they look more like the same as Hawaii, but somehow they had a tremendous quantity of volatiles to drive them. Where did those volatiles come from? Well, you could guess they came from the evaporite basin. So there I am on one of these cliffs of uh, all volcanic plastics. Um, here's another one, so beautiful. Uh, here's another one. They were just like this, 250 kilometers. Those little circles up there are ash ball lapilli, if, if any of you know what that is. You know how a hailstone in a thunderstorm ends up, if you break it open, it looks like an onion. It has many layers of ice because it's gone up and down in the thundercloud collecting ice. The same thing happens in giant ash-filled explosion clouds from volcanoes, but they make layers of ash instead, and then they fall down like pebbles, and that's what those are. So we knew there were huge explosive um, uh, ash-filled clouds. And then uh, here's Ben pointing out um, that wedge-shaped rock is a, is a specular sandstone that we knew come from, came from much further down underground in the evaporite basin and apparently been exploded out and then landed in this unstable, you know, it wasn't moved there by, by water, it just like clunk and landed in this unstable position. Um, within the ash. And so we're looking for evidence for how much explosivity there was. So this was something that we just published in 2020 and was kind of my last big thing here. As we're going through all of those um, volcanoclastic cliffs, I would find occasionally big chunks of charcoal. And I started thinking what else could be burnt in this volcanoclastic pile. And so we got together with Steve Grasby um, who had found uh, burnt coal up uh, in, the, in the Canadian Arctic islands of the age of the Siberian flood basalts. And he published a paper saying, these must have been coal burnt in Siberia and carried around by the winds and dropped in Canada. And that's a lovely hypothesis, but then we were like, we looked and looked and looked and we found no evidence of coal burning. Um, you know, the coals are right up near the surface, the lavas just sit on them like they never burned. But of course, they're hidden in the volcanic plastics. And so the burning happened underground and helped to throw those magmas up in giant explosive plumes. In the evaporite basin, there's not just all those rocks containing sulfur and carbon and fluorine and chlorine that I was talking about, but it was also a petrochemical basin, it remains that way. So there's a huge amount of ground fluid down in the rocks that the magmas were coming through, filled with oils and then uh, interacting with layers of coal. And so those things combusted underground and caused these explosion pipes, which have been found, these huge eruptions of ash-filled rock that covered that whole area that we found. And they're filled with pieces of burnt coal. And especially the ones up at the top right are the way that coal looks when it's burned at high temperature. In the current day, those are only found at high temperature modern coal burning plants. And they've almost never been found in the rock record. And they're all through Siberia. All those places I marked in green, um, any place that there was a tuff, a volcanoclastic explosive rock, uh, it contained burnt coal. And so we found the evidence that that's what was happening. It was, it was, it was being burned from underground. Uh, so it kind of looks like this. So here's all these organic rich units and the coal and the magma's coming up through and it's entraining the organic rich coal rock and, um, and, the, uh, and then exploding outward and it's also then putting a lot of C13 depleted chemistry into the atmosphere in a way that it's going to go around the whole world and perturb the global carbon cycle, um, which is absolutely uh, observed and has been seen for years. How do you make the, the um, isotopic weight of carbon go that low at this time? Well, this is a very good way to do it. So that was one exciting result. Um, and so there's also a really nice recent new comprehensive isotopic analysis of the end Permian, which um, Martin had nothing to do with, but it's just a nice paper if you're interested in these topics. Um, the, the other thing that Ben did was he looked at melting cuisines. And, so, and so, um, so this is a photomicrograph of a bunch of different olivine grains and some other grains of minerals um, set in epoxy. This is epoxy. And then in each of these red circles is what's called a melting cuisine. So the, these, these minerals were forming in a magma underground. And as they were forming, they would trap little droplets of the melt in them. Because maybe you've been wondering yourself if this is not your field, how do you possibly know what the atmospheric chemistry change was 252 million years ago when the, the atmospheric chemicals 
necessarily by definition had left the magmas and gone into the atmosphere and are now gone. So the magmas no longer have them and the atmosphere no longer has them. So how do you know what they were? Well, this is one way, is you find a little time capsule of magma from before it degassed trapped inside a mineral. So this is, uh, lots of people do melt inclusions and we worked with some people who were super good at it and made a bunch of measurements. Ben did, and this was his first thesis paper. Um, now, okay, so pay no attention to the horizontal axis. It's always good when the speaker says that way. This means nothing. Um, but, but vertically, here's sulfur in weight percent. And, and here are the things I want you to see. This black line, the solid line, is the maximum amount of sulfur that's ever been found in the Deccan traps, which is the flood basalts associated with the dinosaur extinction. These dashed lines are the maximum amount found in Lockheed, that eruption in Iceland that caused tens of thousands of people to starve to death. And in the dotted line is the maximum amount found in the Columbia River flood basalts in the northwest of, of the US. And, um, and so that's the data from Siberia. So we had more than twice as much sulfur in some of our rocks than, um, than the other ones had. And, and Ben also did a big paper on sulfur isotopes and demonstrated that the sulfur that did come out at the end Permian did come from the bedrock and was in the magmas this way. So here is what happens when you um, put a lot of carbon and sulfur out into the atmosphere in the amounts we measured in the magmas and we estimated their volumes. Then we went to the National Centers for Atmospheric Research and put it in their end Permian climate model. So the, the dashed lines here, this is a map of the world during the end Permian. The dashed lines are the edges of the land mass. The middle part is all ocean. Uh, the stars are where there is evidence of mutated pollen, which is thought to have been caused by ozone loss and irradiation. And the red is where the Siberian flood basalts were. And so what happens when you put this much carbon and sulfur in is it comes out as, um, as ocean acidification. And so here's the annual average pH of rain in these latitudes um, uh, down to a pH of two. And so it caused a lot of the ocean water to end up as acid as lemon juice. Uh, so that is a major, major environmental catastrophe. Uh, also lots and lots of chlorine. Here are those same maximums from other flood basalt provinces, um, 10 times as much in the Siberian flood basalts melt inclusions, chlorine. And my favorite, fluorine, uh, as much as two weight percent of fluorine in these melt inclusions, it's insane. It's like uh, unprecedented for the kinds of magmas that it is. And they just scavenge it all from the evaporite basin. So what happens when you put chlorine, fluorine, carbon, and water in a hot uh, eruption plume, you actually make naturally occurring chlorofluorocarbons, something that many people never thought was possible. Some exoplanet people said, if we find chlorofluorocarbons, it's, an, it's a sure sign of a technological um, um, uh, civilization, but no, it could just be a flood basalt on a world that has no humans yet. Uh, and so that was amazing to me. And it was the team in Oslo that first demonstrated this. They took cores out of the sedimentary basin. They heated them up the same way they would be in a plume. And they put a gas chromatograph and they measured the naturally occurring chlorofluorocarbons that were released. It was amazing work. So you take your chlorofluorocarbons and you put them into the um, atmospheric models, same map of the Earth. And uh, these are Do Dobson units, which is um, a fabulously obscure um, way to measure ozone. And, uh, and so it's, it's the amount of ozone above a, a square meter in the atmosphere. If you condensed it down, how thick would it be? It's one of those things, how much, um, how much ozone is there. And so um, the minimum ozone that our modern ozone hole ever hit was someplace between 100 and 150. And in these models, the entire world had less ozone than that because of the Siberian flood basalt eruptions. So we've got super acid rain, we've got a lot of heating from CO2, and we have a complete destruction of the ozone um, layer in a sort of decadal um, rhythm of eruptions. And so uh, that seems like it would be enough to completely stress and collapse any ecosystem. And uh, so here's another picture of our team. And so, and so I wanna just end by saying, to me, there were three legs to this stool we were trying to build in the project. One was, um, what was the chemistry of the flood basalts? What could they have done to the world? And so that's the acid rain and CO2 and the ozone destruction. Then, then what would those have done? So you put them in the climate model to find out. And then the other one, the really important one that I haven't talked about is, did we actually prove that the eruptions happened before the extinction? 
because if they just are coincidentally close and when you did the really careful dating, it turned out the extension came first, then all bets are off and this apparently had no effect. Uh, so, so it turns out that, that dating these rocks is incredibly difficult because you really want a zircon with uranium and lead in it to do a really high precision age back 252 million years ago. And it took us five field season to find rocks that had zircons in them that could be dated. And Seth, meanwhile, is uh, fretting over being able to finish his PhD because he doesn't have any rocks yet. But he was perfecting the lab um, procedure at the time. And so, and so and, you know, as of um, five or 10 years ago, he had made um, by far the most precise uranium lead dates that had ever been made by humans. And he did, he redated the end Permian extinction boundary in China. And then he dated all of these rocks and he got them to plus or minus um, 20 to 30,000 years back 252 million years ago and showed that 80% of the eruptions happened before the extinction happened and then eruptions dribbled on. And so we think this is about as close to solving this mystery as you can get without the ability to go back and get much better samples. And, and like, how do you actually prove what killed a given kind of animal? How do you actually prove the way that the ecosystem collapsed? I don't think those things are actually possible. Um, so I think we took a really good positive step toward proving that the flood basalts caused the end Permian extinction. And, and unfortunately, also um, demonstrating that it was done with the exact same chemistry that we're using as humans today. And uh, that of course is the sort of dire warning, not that we need dire warnings, we all understand what's happening. Data is not actually the point it right now, it's you know the emotional engagement to make change. And in fact, um, you know, we have all this film from this and, uh, and at first we thought the National Geographic was gonna do a show about our project. And in the end, they told us that even though it had uh, volcanoes and, and field expeditions, the whole message was actually too depressing for them to make a show about. Isn't that ironic? Um, but what did happen was um, this became a part of, um, of, a, of, a, of, of part of the Hall of Deep Time at the, at the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History. They have some of our data and a little film of us um, in, in the corner of that. So we are reaching people with the message. Um, although, although, as I say, I actually don't think that the message is really the way to make change right now. It's all of us who know that we need to be taking all of our steps toward having better carbon footprint. Um, and in the meantime, I hope what we've done is, is uh, paved the way for other big interdisciplinary projects and just help to put different kinds of data together. So thanks so much for coming today. I really appreciate it. Well, I don't know if people have questions. I'm happy to answer any that, that exist. Isn't she depressing? <laughs> we could go back to talking about frozen mammoths. Yes. That's really interesting. Yeah, I worry that, um, that what's gonna happen is that students won't be able to go anymore. You know, those of us who wish to risk ourselves can probably have a much longer runway to do these things. But, uh, but students who really might supposedly not necessarily know what they're in for or have the freedom of choice or be able to yell stop if stop is the right thing, I worry that they're the ones who are not gonna have the experiences. Because some of these things, it's actually not really possible to make them super safe. Um, and it sounds like you are in the same situation. Yeah, yeah, we need, we need a variety of fixes in our society, don't we? Yeah. Um, they did not overlap very much. And so I started working on Psyche in 2011. And um, mostly by that time, the, a lot of the papers were out or they were in other people's labs to be done. And then Ben was doing a lot of independent work by then. Um, and he now has our whole sample, 400, our, our 400 sample collection, 450 kilograms of rocks that we brought back. Um, and so, and by the way, they are, uh, you know, and it, part of our deal with the NSF, and we were very eager for this, is to make them available. So um, we have a huge suite of rocks from the buoy, and we have all the sedimentary rocks and all the volcanic plastics and all the lavas. 
Um, ben has them at Rutgers, so you can be in touch with him if you want to do work on the samples. Um, and so then, uh, I, and I think I had plenty of time to start working on Psyche after that, and then I just wrote that one cold paper. The, the bigger challenge with running missions is that you're kind of expected to have your full-time job at the university. And, and my job at ASU, I'm actually a vice president, and I run a pan-university initiative about interdisciplinary work. And that's the thing that stresses me out, is trying to do the right thing by that team and the right thing by the psyche team. And so if universities want to do giant projects like space missions, I think the university should probably do the kindness of reminding the faculty member that they actually can't do two full-time jobs, and the university supports them not to. My university is very supportive of me, and I've been claiming I could do it right up till recently, and then I'm like, no, actually, I really can't do all that. So that was the challenge. Yeah. They're all in really different cycles. And so the ozone goes pretty fast. That's kind of a decadal thing, and then it's back. But we also think that the big pulses of magnetism are kind of decadal. Um, and I think that the sulfur rains out also very fast and makes um, acidic oceans you know, on the order of years. Um, but then the carbon dioxide is a longer process. And I don't know what the length of that is. Someone else here might know how long it takes carbon dioxide to come out. I suppose it depends on how acid the oceans are already, how much can the oceans absorb. I'm getting into areas where I don't know the answer. Erupted, um, I'm going to get this exactly right. The, the, the bulk of it was all within a million years, and it did kind of tail off, but, but the bulk of that was even much shorter. Um, and I just don't remember, 60,000 years, I'm thinking, might have been about that. Seth Burgess' paper. I'm sorry, I should have memorized that, but too many numbers to hold in my head. Now, they, there's cool things. There's not just the uranium lead dating, but also the, um, the Russian team from the Schmidt Institute of Physics of the Earth and Moscow State University. They also um, look at the rapidity of the pulses of magnetism using um, paleomagnetic poles. And so you have an idea of how fast the, the magnetic pole is actually wandering on the Earth. And then you can measure the pole in the different lava flows. And then you can figure out what the time is between them, which is really cool. And so um, most of the time, nothing is happening. And then um, episodic big bursts of magnetism. So that partially answers your question. Yeah. Ah, oh. you know, I think that there's really a lot, and um, and and the question that we sort of were asking ourselves were: Are, are there any really like, really big steps that we, with our expertise, could make? Um, one thing that I find incredibly interesting is that we never found, and I never talked to a single Russian scientist who had ever found a site of eruption. Um, and so we assume these were fissure eruptions because that's what they seem to have been in other places. But nobody has found a river cut that goes through a thing that we're like, oh, that's an eruption site. Um, except for some of these pipe eruptions, these explosive pipes. And I got to go to some of those and they're crazy places. Um, but in terms of the lavas, no sites of eruption. And there are almost no paleo soils to be found. Usually with these big flood basalts, there's a hiatus long enough to form a soil before the next layer comes out. And you can use those soils to find out all kinds of things about living creatures that are still around and the chemistry of the surface. We only found one paleo soil in five field seasons. Um, so there, there are a bunch of areas to go into that I think would be really great. Cool. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Caitlin. Okay, so here's the theory. We talked about plumes, right? So, so those of you who studied fluid dynamics, imagine the mantle of the Earth as a tank of fluid. And so it's being heated. And what happens in fluid dynamics invariably is that there are boundary layers at the edges that are not really moving. They're kind of like a little thermal boundary layer at the top and the bottom. So those boundary layers build up as, hot, as they heat up and then waves appear in the top of them and those waves go unstable and suddenly the hot boundary layer material just drains upward in a, in a plume. And so those plumes, the head of the plume kind of forms like a mushroom shape because of drag of the surrounding 
fluid? Are you following what I'm trying to draw with my hands? Make some sense. And so when that big voluminous head of the plume strikes the upper boundary layer, um, it has decompressed, has come up through a lot of pressure, and it has pressure release melting. Because inside the earth, all right, so this is a little diversion from the main story here with the plume and the plume tail. So if I give you rock here on the surface of the earth and I say, please melt this rock, you would raise its temperature until it melted. But that's almost never how rocks melt inside the earth. Instead of changing temperature, it's changing pressure that allows rocks to melt inside the earth. And so as that pressure comes off, the solid rocks have less and less reason to stay solid as the pressure comes off and they melt partially and then they erupt. So that's the big top of the plume. And then after that's done, there's still the tail draining upward. And, and so the plate tectonics is moving over the top and the tail is draining upward. And sometimes the tail makes a little path of volcanism. That's what Hawaii is supposed to be, the tail of a plume. And so lots of people go, where is the plume? Where's the, where's the tail of the plume from Siberia? And um, the answer is there, I guess there are some ideas that it might be uh, a tiny, tiny spot that's now migrated across the North Pole to somewhere. <laughs> Um, but there's really no um, definitive thing that people can point at. And so just a final note on that. One, one of the things that I spent a lot of time doing was making dynamical models of, of the lithosphere, that is the solid plate of the earth after the plume has hit it and all the eruptions have happened. And so one of the things that happened is that magma goes up into the plate and some of it freezes rather than erupting. And the stuff that freezes creates a higher density plate that's also lower viscosity, it's more flowy because it's hot. And then the bottoms of the plate drip off. And it turns out those dense drips completely disrupt the rising plume and stop eruption. And so um, because we think that even during the end Permian, the plate, the lithosphere under the Siberian flood basalt was very, very thick, I think that there isn't a plume tail. I think that all those drips happened and so disrupted the rising conduit that no more volcanism happened. So that's kind of a long, but hopefully not too confusing story. Did you have a question too? Favorite meal. Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> so so uh, we had almost no fine Russian cuisine. Um, we almost never went to a restaurant. Uh, and we were almost never in a town. And so it was a lot of like gorechka with the, and these, and these, the miyasa, the cans of meat. I brought one home <laughs> and they let me bring it through customs. And I just kept it around because it cheered me up for a long time. And then it started to bulge. Me. Um, so, so, so you open up the miyasa and the top of it is a plate of lard. And then under that, that is jelly and meat. And so, and so one time the Russian colleagues caught my colleague flipping the lard away into the river and they're like, no, into the pot. So all the part went into the pot. So those were not my favorite meals, but you're starving to death and so you love them. So, so I have two little stories. One is um, we're up in Hatinga waiting in the geologist's guest house for the helicopter. And um, Volodia, our senior colleague had gone out into the town to try to find us a snack. And he found a place that was making um, pierogies. And he was really excited. And there aren't really shops. There are individual people's houses that they would sell stuff out of the front bottom. You know, so you know that this house has eggs on Tuesday and that house has bread on Wednesday. One of the houses is making pierogi and he brings it back in a bag. And he takes it and he says, wait, let me taste it. And he tastes it. And then he looks at us and he goes, it can be eaten, but not with pleasure. <laughs> that became my, my favorite quote of the whole thing. And so my actual, here's my actual favorite meal. As I was saying, we would hike and, and collect samples for 12 hours and with no lunch, or we'd be on the boats going outcrop to outcrop for 12 hours. And finally, you know, our, our weak, us weak Americans went to the Russians and go like, we can't do lunch, we're really hungry. And they're like, we have no lunch in our box of food. Um, but it turned out they had Snickers bars. And so, and so they, would, <laughs> they would sternly hand, Anya, the graduate student, would sternly hand us each a Snickers, Snickers Linda, Snickers Brad. And we got one Snickers bar for lunch. And so it became this huge, like joyous moment for us that we would eat our Snickers bars. Years later, um, I was super sick. I had this terrible illness and Sam Bowering, instead of calling me up or sending me a card, he just mailed me a bag of Snickers bars, mm -hmm. which I mean, I just burst into tears. It was the best, the best. So Snickers are my favorite. Yeah.
Exactly. No, I didn't mention that. So that thanks for bringing that up. That all happened before the lava eruptions. It, it all underlies the lava, and so and so um, in this one place, the in the the the, um, the geographical center of Siberia, basically, is a little town called Tura, on the um, on the uh, it's on, on the Podkameni Nizhnaya, I think, river, the east east west river. And, um, and at Tura, they'd had a really deep drill core. And that's the one where they found 600 meters of explosive volcanic products. And it grades directly into the lavas. And then the lavas go right on top of it. And so um, it was explosive first and then effusive. 